Hi everybody and welcome to British Gas Solved On Screen Live. I'm Jodie Patel and I'll be taking you through the next hour of our Christmas special, which is how to get the home not just ready for winter, but nice and toasty for Christmas. And joining me for the next hour is our expert engineer, Michael, who I will introduce shortly. But before I get into Michael's introduction, let me just point you to the right hand side of your screen where we'll have the live chat function. So please feel free to send through your questions and I'll do my best to pose them to Michael. And if we don't get around to everybody's questions, we will make sure that British Gas get around to answering every single one of them. But for now, without further ado, Michael, welcome. Hi, hi, how are you doing? I'm good, how are you? Not too bad, bearing up. Bearing up, getting ready for Christmas, I hope. Yeah, yeah, and it's quite busy at work as well. Of course, this is a busy time of year, I can imagine. Now, for those who don't know you and haven't seen you before on these solved on screen sessions, can you just tell us a bit about who you are and what you do at British Gas? Yeah, I'm, um, I'm a technical engineer. I work on service and repair for British Gas. Uh, I've been here for about 28 years now. And um, I, I know, I know, thanks. Um, and I work in central London, so I'll be out and about repairing people's colours and appliances for a busy time. Wow, OK, so 28 years. Let's talk about that, because that is a long time. Now, 28 years means 28 Christmases. So you must have a good Christmas story or two to share with us. What can you, which ones can you make us uh, entice us with? Well, um, it's been a long time since I um, worked at Christmas. Um, but I remember the last time that I did, um, I didn't get a call for nearly the whole day. And then right towards the end of the day, just as you know, Christmas dinner was being prepared, um, you know, the house filled with the smell of um, roast potatoes. I uh, got the job, so I had to leave, oh. delay uh, Christmas dinner. It's good that I got there and made switch to one onion. So what time is your Christmas dinner? Just so the customers know not to call you out during that time. <laughs> Let's protect your Christmas dinner time. <laughs> yeah. I won't be doing it this year, um, but... <laughs> I tell you what, we should have a, should have a deal with it with the customers. If Michael has to leave his his Christmas dinner at his home, it's only fair you eat at somebody else's table. What do you think? Well, under these COVID times, that's a bit tricky now, isn't it? But um, um, <laughs> your engineer to be out and available to um, come and help vulnerable customers with their emergencies. So, by all means, if you do have an emergency, don't hesitate to give us a call. But it is in a um, you know a, a sort of we will be looking after the vulnerable and the elderly without a doubt. Of course, and that's really good to know. So if anybody watching, please don't think that you have to suffer in silence when it comes to emergencies for British Gas. Now then, Michael, let's talk about the Christmas setup for the, for the homes generally. Now is a time where people are starting to think about putting up the tree and the decorations and playing some Michael Bublé even. So when it comes to decorations, what are the key care tips you would suggest for people that they should be mindful of? Um, when you're setting up your tree, just to be um, sensible about where you put it, because with Christmas being here, you have a lot of people having uh, candles and gas fires and have you. So just to make sure that you don't put it in a place where it's going to become a source of ignition. Um, also, with regards to lighting your Christmas lights, it's always a good idea to make sure that you look for a Christmas light that has the correct British standard safety kite mark or series. Ah, so no knockoffs then? No, no. And um, when you're setting everything up, just to make sure that you don't have any um, twisted cables trailing. And particularly if you do have a real Christmas tree to make sure that the cables don't end up dangling into the water reservoir. Um, oh, and Exactly. Now, you could probably reduce a lot of that danger by um, doing some clever little tricks to sort of control your tree. Um, it's never good to sort of leave your tree on overnight uh, when you're sleeping and stuff. So it's always a good thing to turn it off. And you could probably make that a lot easier if you were to have something like a smart plug, you know, so that you can have your tree, I don't know, plugged into one of these babies. Oh, and okay. What's that just then? Just, just, hold and, that um, just hold that for me. It's just a isn't it? So um, you can have your tree plugged into 
this and then control it with the same controls you'd normally use to do your heating, your lights, etc. And you could probably even use it. Um, you can tell your smart speaker to turn on and off. Okay, good to know. Good to know. Okay, so that's helpful, and it sounds like quite a useful feature to have in the home. So that's an adapter that controls the the power supply to keep it safe. Is that right? Yeah. So basically, yeah. So basically, what you would do is you would plug your Christmas lights, for example, straight into this smart plug and then smart plug into your, your socket and then um, that way you can control it whenever you need to without having to get on your knees and crawl underneath the tree to reach the switch. <laughs> well that sounds helpful because yeah there's much better things I'd rather do on Christmas Day let's face it but talking of uh, power supplies it's not uncommon and I've had this happen to me where the fuse has gone on the oven and so there was no Christmas lunch for anyone. What do people do in that situation because we can't have that especially not this year. Totally not. No, we've gone through enough already. Um, so basically, the first thing, always safety first. If there's any chance that you don't feel competent with um, trying to identify what the problem is, you know, get a professional, as always. But if you do are um, in a position where you want to have a look, you could, you could actually try to see by the process of elimination, turning off things on a potential circuit, for example, as you mentioned the kitchen if you were to turn off an appliance to see if you can identify what's causing your um, your fuse to trip out because so many fuse boxes are very how what style design switches fuse strings and what have you it's it's quite wide ranging so if you are able to be able to identify what's causing it to trip out then by all means one at a time you better turn it on hopefully it's not the oven well, talking of ovens, um, the oven's on constantly in our house over Christmas, but I'm just thinking about ways we can use energy in a cost-efficient way. What advice have you got for anyone watching this right now about Christmas Day and how to conserve the home with energy? Really good thing, as you said, um, you know, the oven's on probably most of the day on Christmas Day or, or around the point of the year. Um, what could be done is once you finish doing all your cooking, rather than to leave just the door closed, you could just crack the door of the oven open and that allows all the heat from the oven to sort of keep your kitchen and the rest of your property warm. Lovely little hack there. Yeah, absolutely. And also, I've noticed on Christmas Day, and it, well, any kind of, even if it's a small gathering this year for most people, everyone seems to congregate around the kitchen on Christmas Day. So it makes sense to just use that as the main hub of the house, surely. So... <laughs> Okay, we spoke, yeah, we've spoken about how to conserve the oven heat, for example. What about other ways to prevent drafts from entering the home? How, what, what advice have you got there? Well, um, it's always a good idea to sort of um, have these things done before it's too late, so to sort of not wait until winter to start conserving the heat. Um, you can make get yourself... A, Draft, in, uh, draft excluders fitted around drafty windows. You can get little installation kits that, um, from local DRA shops where you can reduce the amount of drunk coming in your property. Um, you can also um, just close doors in rooms that are not being used. And then if you turn off the heating, um, it will conserve energy so that you're not heating a room that's not being used. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it's really simple. I mean, how many of us just leave doors open without thinking twice about it? But yeah, that would make a lot of sense. Keep the house warm where the people are. Um, talking about keeping place, certain yeah. rooms warm. Sorry. No, I was just going to say with regards to that, you must be very mindful that if you are trying to sort of block any air vents and stuff like that, you must be careful that if you've got a gas appliance that, that actually um, requires ventilation, that you don't actually block up those air vents because that could be quite safety critical. That's true, actually. That's a really good safety tip there. 100% agree. Um, now, talking about keeping certain parts of the house warm, I've heard a lot about these smart thermostats. Is that what they are? Oh, oh yeah. You'd be talking about the, yeah, the, the individual controls you can actually fit to your radiator, you've got a compatible radiator valve, then you can have a um, smart thermostat fitted to that. And then that way you can, you know, control heating that room, wherever it is, from your um, from your smart control. 
and then that way you, you can turn that off quite easily conserving heat again yes and also what about water how does that work with those smart meters i'm still not smart meters sorry smart thermostats can you control heat and hot water from those depending on what kind of a device you uh, kind of a boiler that you have um, you can find that if you've got a combination boiler it wouldn't actually control the hot water but if you have a conventional heating system with a hot water cylinder then yes you would be able to so you would just have um you would have your your done from the thermostat on here so you can set time for it to come on what have you and um it's easily doable yes and is that a hive is that a hive thermostat you've got there because i know they're very popular aren't they yeah, as I said, just so you, you know, not only would you control your um, heating with this, Christmas light, have your lighting, you can do lots of other different bits and pieces with that, yes. Mm, very versatile and very helpful. I mean, you mentioned boilers a minute ago. Let's go back to that because that's a really big part of what British Gas work with. Um, there are lots of people mm. that generally have boilers, especially over the Christmas period. What would be the key advice tip that you'd have for somebody when it comes to boilers generally well it's probably the most common thing that i come across where boilers lose pressure and it will be more than likely one of two things um either there being an issue or just needing to bleed the radiators and just top up your system you know okay let me come back to the radiators in just a minute because i just want to stay with the boiler thing for a moment now there are lots of things that can happen with boilers one thing is that they make a lot of different noises um, there are rattles, there are whirlings and swirlings. What's the what's the, the the kind of noise that you really need to be mindful of with boilers? <laughs> yeah, all kinds. Um, the most important thing is that um, some of that, some of the time when you hear your boiler making funny noises, it may well be because the system's topping up. So um, that would be a matter of actually just you know checking your boiler, checking the system, just to make sure that it is at the correct pressure. So um, I don't right. know. I can show that. I can show you that if you like. Yeah, let's do it. And and while you're making your All way right. to the boiler, while you're heading over to yeah. the boiler, let me just ask you, what is the correct pressure for a boiler? Because I really don't know the answer to that. Well, normally it will be about one to one and a half bar. And um, basically it's all... Um. I think we might have a bit of a technical issue with Michael. Let me don't just... Michael, can you hear us? I can see and can hear see you. Michael. Great. Okay, I just lost you for a moment there. So, sorry, you were saying it's one to one and a half bars of pressure oh. for the board. That's right, that's right. Let me just um, turn my camera around so that you can see what I'm seeing. Uh, uh, camera back. Oh, can you see now? We can see lots of pipes. Um, they all look the same. So, um, depending on yes, <laughs> so depending on what type of a boiler you've got will dictate as to whether or not you may have your boiler's pressure showing on a digital display or maybe a dial on the boiler but uh, some systems will also have it so that it's actually um on the pipe work below so as you can hopefully see here it says i've got this pressure gauge just here try and see if i can get in and show you can you see yeah, that can see that. can see that okay so the normal good operating pressure for a system is about one to one and a half bar. Um, so mine's just on that one point at the moment. So if there was ever a time that you may need to repressurize your system, as I said, it's always a good thing to do this when it's actually off, so you're not messing around and getting burned at all. Um, you will either have a filling point on the system, if you can see where my hand is just here, you will either have it on the system or you will have it maybe underneath the boiler. So depending on what type of a system you've got, it's always good to check with your manufacturer's instructions because you may find that you've actually got an integral filling point built into the boiler just underneath here. But um, you may also, as I said, have it so that it's on your system here. So what you would end up doing is you would have two taps 
which you would use to basically open one and then open another one in a controlled fashion. So you're always keeping control of what you're doing. And then you would pressurize your boiler and get it into the sweet spot where you need to be. So um, once you've got your boiler pressurized to the correct pressure, then you'd basically make sure that you close off both valves so that you don't accidentally repressurize it, overpressurize the system and um, everything's all fine and dandy, which you may find that this is a better thing to do once you've actually um, bled your radiators. And then after you've bled your radiators, you can just come double check, top up your system pressure as you need to, and then away you go. Okay, well, that's really helpful. I think that's, that's quite an uh, informative session that you just did there, so thank you for doing that, Michael. But just a, one yeah. thing I'd like to know, and it's quite a common question that comes through. If the pressure looks like it's okay, but the boiler's still not working, then what do customers do? All right, well, um, so as I said, so long as your controls are saying boiler come on and um, the pressure is okay, you may well find that your boiler has onboard diagnostics. So um, what you may find is that your boiler may be displaying some sort of a fault code. If it is, by checking your manufacturer's instructions, you can find out what that fault code is. Generally speaking, you'll have a reset button on most of these boilers nowadays. And when you press the button, it will reset the boiler, reboot it, and hopefully it will come on. Um, if you find that it doesn't come on or it has a repetitive fault that keeps on happening, then by all means, you want to give us a call and we can come and have a look and see what's going on for you. So really what you're saying is just turn it on and off again. Is that the most, is that the most important <laughs> button on the boiler? <laughs> a bit like the IT yeah. department. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But, um, you know, if you do have a fault code, it's a good um, thing to just make a note of it so that if you do have to call somebody out to have a look at your boiler, you can tell them what it is and it just saves a lot of the um, headache of trying to work out where we're starting from. Okay. Well, listen, thank you for that. That's really helpful. I can just see we've got a ton of questions coming through and I'd like to start answering some of these, but I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that you did want to talk about bleeding radiators before we go into that. So... Did you want to do that first? Well, just before I leave this boiler room, what I was going to just say, um, when it comes to sort of knowing what's, where, what's where on your system, it's always a good idea to just know where your stopcock is. Because if mm. there is ever a problem, if you get a water leak or anything like that, it's always a good, point, uh, good thing to know exactly where that is so that you can turn off the water quickly. And um, just one little bit of housekeeping with your stopcock. When you have it fully turned on, it can sometimes seize up. So it's always a good thing to just not leave it fully turned on, just crack it a tiny bit, just so that it even stops the um, seizing up. Thank you for that, that is helpful. And another question, it might be linked to the radiators or the boiler, I'm not sure, but frozen pipes, when that happens, is that to do with the radiators or the boiler? Well, more often than not, when the temperature drops, um, particularly with these modern condensing boilers, um, they have these condensed pipes. Um, I'm just trying to... Can you see that white plastic pipe here? Yeah. So that white plastic pipe is called a condensed pipe. And some of the time, if your boiler's fitted outside or if a substantial amount of that pipe runs externally, in cold weather, that pipe can actually freeze. And then what will happen is that you'll get your boiler respond accordingly and it will probably lock out and stop working. Now, if that does ever freeze, you can use um, a sort of damp, warm cloth to hopefully defrost the, um, defrost the pipe and get, get the, the ice blockage clear. It's all, make sure that you never, ever do that where you're going to be in proximity to electrics where you may cause an issue. And um, never, ever use boiling water on that pipe, that's for sure. Oh, that's really helpful. So, look, you, you don't want to have to defrost your turkey and your pipes on the same day. So, hopefully, we don't have too much of that period. But yes, um, was there anything else you wanted to mention about boilers before we move on? No, I think that should cover it all. 
Right, okay. Well, that was really helpful for anybody who has not seen pipes in a boiler room before. <laughs> okay, so back to radiators, Michael. Um, you mentioned about bleeding, and it, I've, I've done it myself. It's quite a straightforward thing to do, but for anyone who hasn't done it before, could you just talk them quickly through what that would look like? I don't know if Michael can hear Yes, me. I can. Um, oh, it's cold outside. So, basically, um, <laughs> bleeding radiators, it's a really simple thing to do. Um, all that you would need is one of these, a radiator bleed key. And it's always a good idea to make sure that you've got a cloth handy to catch any spills. And um, as a system, it's very important to make sure that you're not handling hot water or um, causing any issues to, to hurt yourself. And also, just be mindful that if you are having a radiator that uh, needs bleeding and it may be near to any sort of sources of ignition, unless you, um, you, know, you don't have a candle near the radiator while you're bleeding it, because sometimes the air in a radiator is hydrogen. And what can happen? Well, I don't need to say anything else with that, do I? But yeah, it's a very simple thing to do to actually um, feed a radiator. Just one of these, one of these, maybe books. And you just get that hissing sound as well, don't you? And the water splurts out all over you, over you if you're not careful, like I have learned the hard way. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. So, without further ado, let me start going through some of these questions because we have some really helpful insights here from customers wanting to know certain things. I have Jonathan who is asking, my back C combi 30 HE diverter manifold leaks from the actuator nut bush, whatever that is, <laughs> when there is call for DHW. Do I have to drain the CH loop to fit a replacement or can I just close the little bucket valves? What do you reckon, Michael? Because I haven't got a clue what that oh, means. <laughs> that's a really specific and um, in-depth um, question. Basically, that's very boiler specific. And from what he's explaining, it sounds as though he's going to need an engineer's visit because what's happening there clearly is that you've got an internal component on the boiler that's actually leaking. And it sounds as though he's done a little bit of research himself and found out what's going on there. But that sounds as though you do need an engineer visit with that one. I'd say so. <laughs> I haven't got a clue what the question was, but okay. Um, another one here from Samantha Taylor. Hi, Michael. I need to get my boiler moved as part of a renovation project. Should I wait until after the winter or should I not worry about there being any issues? Well, um, depends on whether or not you fancy being cold while it's being moved. Um, Simple as that. I would... <laughs> Yeah, I, I would suggest doing it when you, you, you're sort of comfortable and uh, you're not going to be cold, yeah, without a doubt. But if, if you want to go for it, go for it. Okay. Um, Jess here is asking, I'm working from home, as many people are. Oh, where's it gone? Hold on. Let me just get back that question. Yeah, I'm working from home. My laptop and screen are quite near the radiator due to space. Do you think this is an issue or should I avoid having the radiators on? Um, well... You don't want to be sitting down cold at home, so probably just rejigging where you sit and how you um, where you put put your your laptop. I wouldn't advise you to sort of have it too too close to a radiator. You don't want to cause the laptop any screen issues or anything like that. Otherwise, um, that will ruin all your team meetings. <laughs> yeah, I mean that one seems quite easily resolved. I've got Norma asking, my pipes make very loud noises. Can I solve this problem myself or do I need someone to have a look at this? As also my radiators are hot, I've bled them and it's still the same. You may find that after having bled radiators, as I was saying previously, that maybe the pressure just needs topping up if you've got a um, pressurized system like uh, most systems are at the moment. So maybe um, a trip to your little boiler cupboard and having a look to see whether or not it does actually need topping up and repressurizing. Sounds like that may be what you need. But um, anything more than that, if you do find that it's still making those noises, by all means, you'll need probably a visit as well. Hmm, okay. Um, what else have I got here? Here we go. I've got Arthur Jackson. He's asking, He's saying, I live in a small flat where I have a gas boiler with a thermostat on the wall. If I set the room temperature to 20 degrees, the room heats up to 21. The room cools, but the thermostat says high. Why is that happening? Some of the time, if it is a small property, by the time you actually turn your heating on, and you, you put a whatever um, set temperature it is, by the time the thermostat actually reacts and then the boiler switches off, 
um, there will be an amount of heat that's still um, pushed out by the radiator as such, but it's still clearly hot. That means that um, it will still give off heat and then it will cause you to have this kind of fluctuation. Um, maybe the position of your thermostat may well be being influenced by that, where it may be too close to a radiator or too far from a radiator. So um, that might be a thing to look at where your control actually is slighted and maybe just sort of turn it down, maybe a degree less, something like that. That's really a good tip, actually, because, yeah, I guess it depends where your thermostat's located within the home. If it's in a cooler part of the house, then that will play differently to if it's in the, the hub of the house where the main source of heat is. So, yeah, that's a really helpful tip there. Um, I have a question from Sophie Pierce, but I'm not sure what it relates to in terms of is it radiators or boilers. Do you need to use filtered water if you're in a hard water area? When um, it depends on again what type of a um, heating system you have, because if you have a combination boiler, um, it, it's your heating mains water. If you have an, a, main, a mains pressurized cylinder, again your heating mains water. When you're um, most boiler manufacturers recommend having some sort of live scale protection to stop your boiler from um, having any issues. So depending on where you are in the country, that may well apply. I mean, if you're um, up more of the northern parts of the world, you might not need that, but uh, it's always a good thing to actually sort of protect your system long term. I don't know you could do that. That's quite, I suppose it's like kettles, isn't it, on washing machines to protect those pipes yeah. from getting clogged. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, um, here's a question from another Michael to you, Michael. If you let in too much pressure, is this dangerous? And how do you reduce pressure if you do let in too much? If you do let in too much pressure into your system, um, it's not necessarily at all dangerous. It just means that as your system heats up, there is less tolerance for expansion when, you, um, when the system gets hot. Um, if you do have uh, um, the facility to be able to safely remove some of the pressure by maybe putting a small container underneath a venting valve on a radiator, then that way you could hopefully just open it and crack it, let that water just pour out into a little container safely when the system's off, like I said, um, or you might have a drain point on your system. If that's overcomplicated and you can't handle it, then give us a tool, give us a call. <laughs> Get Michael out on Christmas Day. <laughs> no, just joking. Um, <laughs> AJ's asking, what's the best way to know what the code on my boiler is telling me? That's a good question. You know what these error messages mean, but I don't know if we do. <laughs> yeah. It's funny, I remember when we had the beast from the East a couple of years ago, um, that was probably um, one of the, the, the main things where we were going to customers' houses and you listen to a code and you, you basically know that it was a frozen condensate pipe or whatever. Um, but you'll only know what these codes mean by if you were to sort of refer to your manufacturer's instructions. You may find that some specific manufacturers have common codes that they use. But you need to look at your manufacturer's instructions and see what that code is. If it's resettable, as I said, by all means, give it a try. If it comes on and works, happy days. But if not, then yes, you might need a visit. Wouldn't it be good if they just wrote frozen pipes instead of some code? That would be much easier for everyone. But fair enough. If someone's lost their manual, what can they do to try and work out what these codes mean? Well, if you go to the manufacturer's website, more often than not, if it's a reasonably current boiler, you can actually download instructions for their boilers. Or um, failing that, some boiler manufacturers also have um, brief descriptions of what fault codes are on a drop-down front fascia of the boiler. If you've got a little plastic fascia panel that covers the controls, I'm not saying that open the boiler up. Um, so if you have a little drop-down panel, it may actually say what those fault codes mean underneath there. But if not, go online. Okay, always helpful. Go to go online. Okay. Um, oh yeah, here's one from Samantha. Now that we're all working from home a lot more, it gets really cold without the heating on. But I'm worried that having the heating on all day isn't the best either. What's your advice? My advice is probably to leave your system at a reasonably lowish temperature, just so it takes the chill out of the property. Clearly, that now that we are working from home, it's inevitable that. Um, our energy consumption is going to be more. So whatever you can do, the good fix is to sort of um, maybe have your home office in a um, 
a, a, a common part of the house so that, that you're not heating all of the house. You're heating just that common area, then closing the doors, keeping the heat in just one place, and then just keeping it just a little bit lower. It might be, um, it might not be convenient for you to use, use your system on a timer, you know, point when you're working from home. So just to keep it a bit more of a lower consistent heat and get one of those Christmas jumpers on. <laughs> Always a good excuse to put a Christmas jumper on. But you talk about a lower heat. What, what would be like an ideal temperature? Is it variable based on the property? Um, normally about 20 to 21. That's about 68, 70 Fahrenheit. That's a, a good common temperature. But with some of these um, more modern thermostats, you may find that you might need to have it a degree or so more just because of how they work, how much more sensitive they are to fluctuations in temperature. Okay, yeah, no, that's helpful. Thank you for that. And who else have I got here? Uh, yes, um, Hamish Shalad, he's saying, hello, I haven't had anyone bleed my radiators in a few years. Is it something I can do myself? And is it difficult to do? You obviously spoke about this a bit earlier, but on an easy, easy to hard scale, one to 10, how easy is it to bleed a radiator, would you say? Oh, um, if one is easy, <laughs> um, then yeah, I'd, 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 be looking at those, <laughs> I'd be looking at those low numbers. Um, but basically, you will know if your radiator needs bleeding because it will more than likely be colder at the top and then hot at the bottom. That will signify that um, you know it's not full of water. So, using a radiator bleed key, you'll be able to um, just open the vent at the top of your radiator and then um, wait for whatever air that is in the radiator to come out. And then when you do see water, you just close it again. So you don't need to fully unscrew it. You just need to crack the actual um, little screw that you're turning with the key. You just need to crack it. And if you hear hissing, let the air come out and then close it off again properly. Hey, Mish, here's a tip for you. If I can do it, and I'm really not good at these kind of things, anyone can do it. It is quite simple. Uh, Michael is right. You just crack that screw thing at the top let the air hiss out and then just turn the key again and job's done and it's quite instant isn't it you know that it's working again because the heat just travels straight up through the bottom of the radiator so yeah, uh, yeah good luck with that hamish i have who else do i have here um i've got somebody who i think we've already said this one norma she's saying that her pipes make loud noises she's bled them all but it's still the same issue yeah we've done that one James Hardy, uh, my boiler makes a metallic clunking noise when it switches itself on. Is this normal? Hmm. No, um, doesn't sound normal. You may find that you've got a faulty component in the boiler, either something that spins probably a fan or a pump or something like that that might be faulty and um, coming to the end of its usable life. Um, so you probably want to get an engineer to come out and have a look at that. Um, but hopefully it's going to keep working until you do that. Okay. Thank you for that. I've got Shay. Sh I hope I'm saying your name right. Right, Shayad Shahir. Hi, Michael. Would you recommend changing your boiler if you're planning to do a loft conversion, which would include an additional bathroom? If your current boiler is um, capable of heating the extra space that you're going to create by doing the loft conversion. And also, if it's an efficient boiler, then um, you could probably get away with um, actually just making the extension. But if you find that your boiler is not so efficient, or if you find that it's undersized, only a professional will be able to tell you that really, to be honest with you, because they'll work out the size of the property and how you know how big your radio is and give you the, the adequate advice. Um, so if it's a less efficient boiler, it might be a good time to actually consider making the money energy savings because you'll be having a you know a more efficient boiler do the job for you so it might be a good time to consider doing that while you've got all the other people mm, good good point like that okay hope that was helpful um frankie is asking is it more energy efficient to turn the heating on only when it's needed but having to heat from cold each time or better to maintain a steady temperature all day does that relate to the I, 2021 um, degree thing that you mentioned earlier? Um, to, to a point, um, me personally, I, I 
don't use a timer through my heating system for most of the house. I just have one zone that I just turn on so that it comes on in the morning just to take the chill out of the room so I can get ready for work. Um, so the rest of my property, what I do is I um, I just turn on a, a room or a zone as and when it's needed and the doors will normally be closed so I'm not wasting heat. As I said, that's really easily achievable if you have one of those high thermostats or if you have, um, you know, multiple zones on different floors, then you can actually easily achieve that. Okay, thank you for that. Um, can you just show us, going back to the radiator question, I'm just thinking of Hamish earlier. Is there any chance you could just actually show somebody how to bleed a radiator in real life so that they can visually see the process? Yeah, no problem. Uh, one second. On. <laughs> the magic gloves on. Yeah, magic gloves. And uh, do it. I'm just going to switch the camera around. Uh, there we go. Oh. Can you see that? Yes, we can. So. On this valve, basically, it's got a screw in it that's square-edged, and um, it's also got a screwdriver slot on it. So in this scenario, if you didn't actually have a bleed key, what you could do is you could just use a flathead screwdriver to actually vent this radiator. So as I said, you would always make sure you've got your cloth handy, and you'd have that underneath just ready and waiting to catch any drips. Um, and then what you would do, you would have your bleed key and you fit that in here. I think you'll probably find that this radiator is going to probably be full. But if when you just cracked that open, as you heard the little click there, I've just loosened it. And then I've just cracked it open oh so slightly. And one of two things will happen. Yeah, as you can see, there's a tiny little drip of water that's coming out of there. I don't know if you can see that drip of water can you see that okay. right so once once you see the water then you know that the radiator is full you close that off should have made any mess but you just wipe that down make sure that's actually closed off happy days that is a happy day good job hope that was helpful hamish um what else have we got here ken yeah we've done the bleeding okay the radiators have thermostats attached on a one to five setting this is from Arthur Jackson. He's asking, is it better not to use them with the control thermostat on the wall? Um, we have a thermostat that has um, one to five type settings. You, you kind of, over time, just learn out what setting works best for you in any particular room. So no two sets of valves are the same. So one on a one manufacturer's valve will be maybe slightly different to a setting on another valve. But if you do have a type of a valve like this where you will actually get um, you'll actually get a temperature that you can set on it, this is much more reliable because you can actually set it to your desired temperature and it will do the business and then um, shut off when it gets up to temperature. So something like that would be much more handy. Um, but you shouldn't really have a thermostatic radiator valve too close to uh, the proximity of a thermostat that you've got on the wall because sometimes they can conflict each other in sort of knowing what the correct temperature in place is. Okay, good Good to know, good to know. And I've got somebody asking here, when we run the hot water, our pipes whistle, how can I fix this? Hmm. You might find that you have um, a restriction in flow. Um, sometimes a stop cock could be faulty and cause that, where it, you know you get a restriction in flow and it's just a surge of water trying to force through the, the valve. But um, when when you sort of talk about noises, you know, as, as a symptom, some of the time it's better to actually just have somebody look at it because what could happen is that you may get the wrong advice according to what you're trying to describe, and you may have something else that's causing the problem. So. Um, so it's always a good idea to get somebody in. Fair point. Good advice. Um, <laughs> I've got a lady called Pip asking, where did you get that radiator from? It looks fantastic. It did look very good, actually. Where did you get it from? <laughs> oh, thank you. I bought that online. Um, I, I, I'm not going to start plugging <laughs> companies. 
But um, yeah, I got it online actually. Okay. I'm sure if you were to Google, online. I can't find it. <laughs> Okay, well, hopefully that could be on your Christmas list, Pip. <laughs> yeah. um, what should you do if you have a power cut, especially on Christmas Day? Let's be honest, that's, if it's going to happen, that'll probably be the day it happens for a lot of people. What do you do in that situation? If you do have a power cut, um, if you were to go to your um, electrical consumer unit, you may see that you have a series of switches and it would be wise to just have a look first and see whether or not one individually has gone or whether or not there is a whole bank of switches which has tripped out. As I said previously, always be really safe about what you're doing. If you don't feel competent or if you've got to reach and stretch and do something inconvenient, you know, get somebody in who can help you. But what you may find is that you may have a whole bank of switches on your, fuse, your consumer unit that have tripped out. Um, you may be in a position where you can individually turn one switch off until you find out what has actually caused it to trip out. Then if you find that um, whatever's causing it to trip out is on, I don't know, the kitchen circuit, for, for example, you may be able to reinstate other circuits which will get you going until you identify then the next level as to what's causing it in the kitchen for example but um if you're at all feeling unsure about it get a professional win it's much better to do that oh agreed better better to do that for sure uh, back to radiators sorry i'm just back flitting back and forth based on the order the questions are coming through but i've got one again about radiators here how often do we bleed the radiators michael um always a good thing to do before the start of your winter season. Um, but generally speaking, you'll know if it needs bleeding because you'll feel that the radiator is partially hot. Um, hopefully it will be partially hot where it's cold at the top and you'll probably feel oh, it's half hot and you'll feel just the level where it, it, it sort of then becomes cold. That's the point at which you'd need to sort of check and bleed it. And then if you do get a lot of air out of the system, um, then as I said, you may need to go and check to make sure that the pressure in your system gets topped up accordingly. Okay, I hope that was helpful, Philippe. Um, Samantha Taylor, should I be unplugging my electricals, such as TV and lamps, when not in use, or is it safe to leave them plugged in on standby? What's your answer to that one? With um, a lot of devices being on standby around the house, um, you do use a much more reduced amount of energy, but some of the times when you do turn something completely off and unplug it, then you may find you have to turn it on again and, you know, you have to reboot it and, it, you know, it's got to initialize, find its new settings again. Um, having it on standby is probably more convenient, but if you are energy conscious, and particularly so if you do have a smart meter, you may be able to actually monitor the difference between having these appliances on and having them off and see what you're actually saving. So then you would make the decision yourself as to whether or not you think it's worth doing. And are there any devices in particular that just really drain the energy compared to others? Should you be selective about which ones you're focusing on? A lot of energy efficient um, devices nowadays, um, when they're in standby mode, they don't consume much um, energy. So um, you could have a look in the instruction of whatever TV or whatever it is we may be talking about. Um, you know, being wise with your energy use, it's always good to do things. If you do have um, tariffs for your energy where you can get, um, you can use energy at a lower rate at night, for example, I tend to put my um, washing machine and dishwashers on just as I'm going to bed. So, you know, they, they sort of run on a delayed cycle, so it'll be ready in the morning when you wake up. Um, and to have efficient things like freeze, fridge freezers, um, as I said again, washing machines, dishwashers, to have them that are sort of high energy ratings so you know that um, you're going to be saving a lot of money when you're using them. They're, they also save water as well, potentially. That's always a good thing for an investment. Mm. I don't know about the, um, well, the washing machine at night. That's a good little tag there. I'll have to consider that one myself. I like that. Um, okay. Oh, here we go. Is it better to heat water in the evening or just the morning ahead of when you need it? Based on what you've just said, I'm guessing, well, you, you give the answer. It depends on what kind of a um, family life you have. You know, if you've got lots of people waking up at regular times, 
and uh, or if there's a lot of kids in the house and you need water at regular times, then it would make sense to time your hot water so that it's ready for when you need it. Um, another good little hack is that if if at all possible with the type of control that you've got, it may be a good idea to actually make your hot water come on a little bit earlier so that your boiler will come on, fire up and heat your water. And then when your heating kicks in, your boiler can divert all of its energy and output to just heating your radiators. So it will hopefully sort of come on a little bit more quick for you. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, another quick fix tip, everyone wants quick fixes today. Uh, what should you do if you don't have any hot water? This is true. What do you do? If you don't have hot water, um, if the water's coming out of the tap cold and should be hot, then um, clearly you've probably got a problem with your boiler. Depending on what type of a heating system you've got, whether or not it's a combination boiler or a conventional system with a cylinder, you might want to start with the basics just to check to make sure that your time clock's working and it's making a demand for hot water um, to potentially check to see if, if you do have, um, for example, a wireless thermostat type of device, um, just to make sure that the batteries are on and it's sending the signal because a lot of the time you'll have, I don't know, a receiver, something like this, and it may have a light on it to say whether or not it's actually getting the signal to say hot water or heating come on. So you can check on this to see whether or not this is actually getting the signal from your thermostat. Um, those are the easy fixes that you can do at a glance. Um, anything more over and above that, you'll then start to go into the realms of seeing whether or not your boiler's got a flashing fault code on it or whether or not you have um, valves. I don't know if you noticed when I was in my boiler cupboard, my boiler room, I had um, some little silver motorized valves which controls different zones so you probably have one for the hot water and at least one for the heating respectively so just check to see whether or not they are sort of sticking or if they're open um anything more, more than that again you're talking about getting getting um, somebody to look at your system for you okay thanks for that that was very informative appreciate that i have who else have we got here clarissa she's asking my radiators are old and the paint is chipped if there, is there any danger in repainting them myself and would their efficiency be reduced as a result? No, the efficiency won't be reduced, but what you do have to just take into consideration is that um, the type of paint that you paint it with, it's, it's, it, 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 you said it was the, the radiators were old. Um, some of the time, if you use the wrong type of paint, it can flake quicker than it would normally. So you just have to make sure that um, you're, you're getting the correct type of paint that's suitable for radiators when you're, when you're shopping around. Good to know. Clarissa, it's like nail polish. Some chips some chips better than others or worse than others. So yeah, get good quality paint is what you're saying, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Um I've got somebody asking, would a thermostatic radiator valve be worth using? And will this help with being energy efficient? It's the easiest way of being able to turn on and off your heating system. And, um, you know, as I said, you can set different levels around the house. If you have a thermostatic valve that has numbers on it, one to five or one to max, whatever it may be, you will over time get used to what works in that particular room. And also it's a good way of being able to easily turn off um, a radiator. You know, because the thermostatic valves, they tend to be um, much more user friendly to be able to control. Hmm, makes sense. Okay. Um, oh, here's an interesting one. It's from Pip again. Are smart meters dangerous for health? Why, why would that? I've never heard of that correlation. Are smart Did you meters say dangerous. dangerous. For health? Yeah. Is that is that something? There's a link there. I, I think there's always been a, um, a preconception that smart meters are big brother watching down upon us. Um, but smart meters, just to sort of clear up any um, confusion, they can actually be quite convenient because it saves you firstly having to go underneath that little meter cupboard under the stairs or wherever it may be to take meter readings every time they're due. Um, secondly, it's always a good awareness thing because you'll probably have a little display and um, what the display will show you is your energy usage. And you may be able to sort of, you know, have a look and see what the difference is between boiling a kettle that's full or boiling a kettle that's just got the right amount of water in it. Because a kettle is one of the most power consumption hungry appliances in your house that you'll use, along with things like the microwave and the oven, etc. So um, you'll be able to see how your energy consumption is. 
So that that's always a good thing. You know that your energy supply will be getting an accurate meter reading by having it. So there wouldn't be anybody, big brother, looking down to see whether or not you're um, making toast too regular. <laughs> no, but it's good to know that certain appliances are soaring up more energy than others. I mean, the kettle, yeah, that that's quite a surprise to me because that's the one I probably use the most. So that would mm -hmm. explain some of my bills. Um, what else have I got here? Samantha Taylor, another question for my renovation project. I noticed you have a gas hob. We're thinking of getting an induction hob. Is one more efficient than the other? That's interesting. I think that there are... Um... My personal preference is I just think there's a, a, a sort of trustworthy, tangible thing of seeing a flame and knowing when you put it on a high, how high high is and how low low is, et cetera. Um, and it also depends on whether or not you've actually got a gas point where you're going to put your hob. So um, induction hobs can be quite cool because, um, you know, you can have these fancy pops that we add to them and return them up and take the pot off the, off the heat. It's still down to pro, um, personal preference and um you know the practicality of whether or not that appliance will suit your um your house basically yeah and i'm glad you mentioned the pot thing because um samantha that's something i came across is that you have to have special pans for induction cookers so just be mindful of that if you are thinking of having one and who else have we got arthur jackson long term what's going to happen to the gas infrastructure as new homes only have electricity well um the world we're all committed to making energy savings and um, becoming carbon neutral as best as possible as quickly as possible so um in the boiler world uh boilers are being fitted in new bills to a certain extent um and there will be an industry that will evolve with new technologies in the same way during the 60s and 70s i think it was there was a gas conversion that happened where we went from using town gas to natural gas which we currently use now so um, with the future and tests and things being done um in the background they're going to be using different types of energies like hydrogen and stuff like that which will be integrated and allow hopefully um a lease of life for the current boilers. But it'll be a lot more efficient than what we're currently using. It'll be much more clean and friendly to the environment. So that will go on until such a point when um, gas boilers are no longer allowed to be fitted, which um, I think the government have mentioned uh, recently when that will actually be. But there's a little way off yet. Mm, okay, thank you for that. Um, I've got Manoj Kumar asking, what do you recommend as an ideal number of hours for heating to be switched on for a three bedroom home? It totally depends on whether or not you've got a drafty Victorian property or a real slick modern carbon neutral place with double glazing and well insulated. So no two houses are the same. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like to think that, you know, if, if you've got a house with a reasonably efficient boiler and um, correctly sized radiators that probably within an hour you should feel something coming through. So um, if not, then maybe you want to look at how you're using your energy and how efficient your boiler actually is and whether or not it's, it will save you money to replace it and also keep you more also, comfy as well. Yeah, and also I was just going to say, it probably depends on what, what's happening within the home in terms of the people living there and the level of activity. And right now everybody's working from home, or most people are, so that will have a huge impact. But I want to come back to quickly something you mentioned before we start thinking about wrapping up, which is you talked a lot about, well, you touched on the elderly and the vulnerable during winter earlier. What can we do to make sure that those pockets of our community are looked after during the period over Christmas especially, but during the winter as well? Well, we've also got to throw in the current COVID situation. Um, you know, it's always good to check on a neighbour, but, you know, depending on what kind of lockdown restrictions you have in any particular area of the country where you live in, it's just good to make sure that, you know, you sort of pop in as well. Just, just make sure that your neighbour's safe. You might not be able to pop in due to the different sort of variations of what kind of socialising bubbles we're going through at the moment. But just to sort of ensure that you, you know, your neighbour's um, active and about, and she's okay, or he's okay, give it a thumbs up through the window, or whatever. If you're sort of not not actually visiting and going in, um, but you know, if if anybody vulnerable or elderly out there have any issues, it's really important to emphasise that, you know, even though we are um, in this horrible extreme time of COVID, we are, you know, looking after these vulnerable customers and calling out. And just like the first wave of the pandemic, we've been out there and we've been looking after customers all through this and wearing our masks and PPE appropriately. So 
by all means, don't hesitate to give us a call because we are here for you. Thank you. And thank you for all the hard work that British Gas are doing, because you're right, you've been looking after your customer base as best as possible during some really challenging times right now. And it's very much appreciated by myself and everybody watching. So thank you for that. Um, I think we've got time for maybe one more question. I just want to make sure it's something that we've not had already. Here's, here's a, quite a common one, actually. Um, how can I make sure that appliances are not producing carbon monoxide? Well, um, firstly, it's always a very, very good safety conscious thing to have yourself a carbon monoxide alarm, because the only way that you know that there is a problem is if you actually have one, because carbon monoxide, you can't smell it, you can't taste it. So, um, that's that's a massive one first. Then going back to what we were mentioning about drafts earlier on, if you find that you have a particular appliance that actually needs ventilation, um, you mustn't block the vents because you know so at this time of the year you can find that putting on your gas fire and you have your vent supplying fresh air into the room, you might think, oh, it's blowing cold air on your ankles, but actually it's there to supply fresh air so that your appliance can work safely. So it's really vitally important not to block those vents up. Because that can create a very dangerous situation. And just make sure you get your appliance serviced annually. Yeah, no, thank you. That That's obviously part of the, what you guys do to keep our home safe and make sure we're not breathing in carbon monoxide. Um, Michael, we've got a few minutes left. I just want to think about wrapping up the session. First of all, thank you so much to everybody who's been watching and sending through such great questions. Anybody that's not had their questions answered, we will make sure that that happens, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. But before I go on to that, let me just say thanks so much, Michael, for sharing all your amazing pearls of wisdom, the tips and tricks to keep the home toasty and warm for Christmas. There's been a lot of content that we've covered during this conversation today. What's your number one takeaway tip for anybody who's been watching? The biggest, biggest thing is just closing doors and turning off radiators when you're um, not using a particular room. It's a massive energy saving, and um, that's that's the easiest thing to do. Just go into a room, turn off the heating, close the door. Great. Well, that's simple enough. Thank you for that. Um, listen, Michael, thank you, and thank you for everybody who's been attending today's session. We're going to continue with the questions on hashtag solved on screen. If you have Twitter, please send us your questions on there. The slide is up right now and somebody from British Gas will get back to you with a direct response. We've had so many great questions. I really appreciate all the participation and engagement. From me, I would just like to wish you all a very Merry Christmas and we'll see you shortly in the new year. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.